From the Auto Line Studios, here is your host, John McElroy. I want to thank you for joining us on Auto Line this week, where we're going to be talking about all this electronic connectivity going in cars, and I got three experts to delve into the topic, including Tilo Kozlowski, the vice president and head of automotive research at Gardner, Henry Bizet, the head of the connected car at Kia, and Jim Keller with Honda R&D Technical Research, and great to have you all here on AutoLine great this week. Thank you. Glad to be here. Tilo, let me start with you. You know, I, I started out by saying connectivity. Others call it telematics. Then there's V to V and V to I and V to X. Absolutely. What are we talking about here, really? It's pretty complex, isn't it? But at the end of the day, we're talking actually about what I refer to as the connected vehicle. And within the connected vehicle, you have four functional areas. Telematics, this is really the safety and security focus. That's where OnStar started out with. Then you have infotainment, which has seen a lot of activity over the last couple of years. Then you have what I call connected advanced driver assistance systems. That's where V2X, you know, V2V, V2I falls into, and even the self-driving vehicle. And then we have a fourth category that I call mobility innovations. And that looks into new ways of thinking about transportation mobility. Maybe not vehicle ownership, but instead mobility on demand. Henry, you're with a car company, Kia. Do you guys see it the same way? No, definitely. I mean, the connected car actually is becoming the overarching way to communicate technology. And it started with telematics uh, back in the day, and then infotainment, entertainment took its place and so forth. And now uh, active safety is becoming very critical to it as well. So if you pull the whole thing together, that's kind of the, the essence of the connected vehicle. And Jim, I know one of your particular interests in this is the benefits that we can get out of automotive safety in this. That's right. I agree with Tilo. The, uh, and I think the, the really interesting thing is, is when you have a connected vehicle uh, with, with infotainment plus uh, connected vehicle safety, uh, and, and we include V2V with that, uh, I think there's huge benefits in safety from, from the sensors that we have today. But then if you include the, the connected vehicle, I think there's big benefits uh, heading this way. We're starting to hear some automakers and other safety advocates talk about zero fatalities. Is, is, I, I see that as very realistic. As an expert in this, how do you see it? We believe in that, and, and it's on our roadmap for technologies into the future. Honda's a big supporter of zero fatalities, and um, that's, that's our direction, and I think that's the direction of the industry. Tilo, today in cars, we see some apps that are in the in-car system that you might be able to use with your phone. There's some Bluetooth, there's some internet. Uh -huh. Paint a more complete picture of where this is all going. Oh my God, so now, now you really open Pandora's box, right? <laughs> because there's so much stuff in the car. It's kind of tricky to actually estimate where this is all going, but I do believe that ultimately at the end of the day, all of these technologies, plus cloud computing, plus the internet of things, and I refer to it actually as the internet of cars first, that then leads to the internet of things, where other things are connected to the vehicle. All of that, I believe, will actually lead to the car becoming the coolest mobile device that you can think of, because it's really the ultimate mobile device. You're truly mobile in a vehicle, and because you have all of that real estate in a vehicle that can deploy all of these technologies that you're talking about, plus knowing exactly where the driver sits and where the passengers sit, all of that will actually create something very unique that will be so aware of what's going on in that cabin and allow you as a driver to interact with your environment and stay connected that I think all of this will lead to this ultimate mobile device. So that's where all of these technologies are getting to it. But there will be lots of different technologies until we get there. Henry, this has got to be music to any automaker's ears. At a time when we keep reading about how young people, millennials, are not that interested in cars, can the automobile once again become the coolest device out there? Oh, no, absolutely. And this is part of the uh, planning, you know, uh, planning in terms of uh, us thinking about those digital natives and millennials who are ultimately live a digital life. And so from our perspective, you know, we need to make the car as a cool device for them so that way they can embrace it later and think of it as far beyond just a transportation A to B, but also a cool place to be uh, while driving as well. So there's a critical aspect to this that we as OEMs think about very upfront. Jim, what do you think about that? Because while you're looking on the safety side, people like to know their cars are safe. That's not necessarily the primary thing that drives them to go out and buy a car. That's true, but it is a base expectation. Like Henry's saying, that's our target is to, to uh, you know, satisfy customers. But the realities are also we have, to, we have to protect them and we have to be aware of driver distraction and not only uh, give them the, as much as capability as possible, but also keep, keep it within uh, the realm of safety. And so to balance uh, the di driver distraction aspect as well as the accessibility and the connectivity uh, needs of the customer, that's our, 
as an industry, that's what we're struggling with every day. What's the thinking at a car company where in, for all the reasons you, you mentioned, you want people to be safe, but at the same time, research will show that, for example, using even a hands-free phone can be distracting. Yet, there's no way you're going to pull people's phones out of their cars. I mean, society has adopted that. So what's the thinking at an OEM, and at a car company, and how do we give the customer what they want and yet keep them safe at the same time? It's a constant uh, debate within the company, to be honest, and, and it's a debate within the industry, and there's a... Uh there's actually a uh, friction point between uh, the DOT and the industry on this point, um, and we're working through those, but um, it, it's an uh, internal tension point in, <laughs> uh, to, to, uh, to, to meet those needs, uh, of both of the, the distraction aspect and the, and the accessibility. Um, but it's, it's not answered. It, it ain't no, easy. Nobody has the right <laughs> answer yet, and, uh, but we're all working on it. Henry, you know, uh, some things that car companies can do, for example, is you can't, in most cars, no. use the navigation sa system to, to input addresses when you're driving sure. along. But can you give us any other thoughts as to what you're looking at? No, absolutely. And this is ties into the previous question. Is uh, It's all about the user experience. Uh, I mean, there are certain things that uh, drivers will do uh, no matter what we do in terms of limiting them from doing it, right? I call them basic things you do while driving, which is that's number one, drive. And so phone calls are made and received, and as well as music being listened to. Navigation is needed to aid you in the act of driving. There's a traffic aspect. Hey, is, is, how's the I-96 looking today? Those are really actually things that, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, people use uh, more than anything else while driving. And so the, the key, in my mind, is the user experience. How to seamlessly uh, make that user experience lessen the burden of distraction. Uh, there's no way we can take it 100% away, but how do we embrace it and work together with the DOT on guidelines or, or direction in which makes sense for those, for those drivers? Henry, I th or uh, uh, Tilo, I think Henry just said a, a key word there, personalizing right. it for the driver. Isn't that one of the amazing things about this technology is personalizing the whole experience to an individual? Absolutely, and, and, and personalization is part of what I call context awareness. And that will allow you to actually bring down the information load that you have as a driver in a vehicle to a minimum so that you can consume information and still concentrate on the main task, which is driving, right? But maybe just to also add to, to this whole discussion, we can't as a, as a country or government say people should not do this stuff. It doesn't work like this. Because even if you turn off the navigation system in a car while I'm driving, people just pull out their phone and use the navigation application on there because guess what, that works, right? So people have certain needs that we need to address and I think by using technology, it will become the answer to address driver distraction. And you do this by having uh, context awareness in the car, personalization, and ultimately the car will become, as a result of all of these technologies, self-aware. Meaning if I know I'm, you're driving in a car at a high speed, maybe that phone call should be rerouted into your voicemail because now you're occupied with passing up other vehicles. If I'm stopped at a stoplight, of course I can consume information, right? But there's a, another big, I think, difference between the way we think about consuming information in a car versus other environments that we're in. It's not about internet browsing. I call it actually internet snacking that you do in the car. Pieces of information that I need to know that I can consume while I still focus on the task. I was just gonna say, I, I, I totally agree with that. And I, and I think if, if you look at the trajectory of our companies and, and you look at the active safety uh, equipment that we're putting in the cars, it will allow, like you're saying, context aware. It will allow the, the driver to do much more than, uh, you know, than than uh, should be done uh, in in certain circumstances. Where if there's a lane keeping system or an adaptive cruise control engaged, uh, the accessibility should be increased, yeah. and uh, or if you're stopped. But in a heavy traffic situation, if there there's an understanding, that's those systems should be locked out. And Henry, what, what are your ideas? And I love that, of the self-aware car. Yes. So essentially what is going on is a lot of this technology actually is uh, somewhat available in a premium segment vehicle. So you walk into a premium segment vehicle and it has uh, a variety of automated driving features. You know, we talked about adaptive cruise control, collision, avoidance, and so forth. What you're going to find is a trend of this technology transcending down to the mass market. So you're going to find a vehicle that is you know, in the $25,000 range that possibly could have this type of feature that could help uh, in the act of context awareness and enhancement of the safety and the driving in the context of, of driver distraction. 
Let's talk a, a little bit about that technology because yeah. when you get into uh, lane discipline, blind spot detection, adaptive cruise yeah. control, that can sort of be standardized because most automakers are buying that technology from suppliers anyway. But when we get into this telematics or connectivity or vehicle to vehicle communication, what's in this case Kia's thought? Right. of are you going to get into the hardware of doing it, the software, what's the thought at Kia? So essentially we consider software to be a commodity. I mean, in terms of the, you know, what is owned or not owned by the OEM, what do we focus on or not? Obviously software is a commodity and hardware is also a commodity. The way we look at it is, is a system approach. You have to have systems that deliver optimized results. And so in terms of the, what we think is the best approach is really to take the commodities of these pieces, and as well deliver, uh, which we think is proprietary and, and it's, it's IP for us, is the systems approach and how it integrated comes together for our, for our drivers and customers. Jim, what about at Honda? Because Honda tends to be a company that likes to do it in-house. <coughs> that's true, that's true. And, uh, but I, I think this, in the end it's the same, uh, whether, whether we purchase the hardware and write the software or uh, you know, uh, or, or, or outsource the software. In the end, it's the user experience, and that's something that, you know, every company's after and t trying to, uh, you know, offer the biggest value to, to the customer. Henry, uh, uh, or Tilo, excuse me, let's go to you. Uh, there was recently, or earlier this year, the, the Car Connectivity Consortium was formed with a number of automakers. I believe Apple's even part of this. Is, is that what is needed, is more of a common kind of hardware software approach, or do you think different automakers and their suppliers will go in different directions? You will definitely have a, a, a much more diverse approach to all of this. There won't be one standard. That's not how the automotive industry works, has never worked, and quite frankly, that's not how a lot of the consumer electronic and internet companies work either. Right, so you're referring to the Open Automotive Alliance, for example, that was formed by Google earlier this year. And that's Google's attempt to control access to the vehicle for its own content and for the Android operating system. So there's an interest, of course, that Google has, and Apple has CarPlay, their equivalent to this, to get their ecosystems extended into an automobile. Now, I think it's good because people have these digital lifestyles that you know, kind of reside on these devices and they want to bring them into the car. However, I also point out to the automotive industry always, you have to kind of balance how much you let these folks come in because at the end of the day, there's only that much space on your dashboard. And if too many others take that up, what is really left for you? And we're talking about differentiation from a lot of these things. Well, that might not be a huge opportunity anymore if all of these other guys are coming in. So you will have much more complexity yeah. going forward before you have a standard that will make it easy for everyone. But that's the exciting part. That's how you create differentiation. And I believe whoever really does this well, the human machine interface piece, who creates that compelling customer experience, those will be the ones that will really succeed with that. It's not so much the content, it's how you actually enable me to consume that content in a car. And Henry, as these consumers or car drivers or people in the car consume yeah. this information, there's a revenue component to it, or a potential yes. revenue component to it. Do you think automakers, is Kia thinking about how do we get a little bit of this money coming into the car? Yeah, this is, this is a great question, and uh, I get asked that quite a bit. So, you know, our approach is kind of uh, pragmatic when it comes to what we're talking about here. Essentially, the business case is not about, you know, what is the infotainment system generating in revenue, or what is telematics generating in revenue. We look at these technologies and, and the safety technologies as a halo for our brand, especially our brand. We're a young brand in this market. And so in terms of what it, does it provide, it's very holistic and a very halo effect that has, in our mind, a lot of value down the road, five years from now, 10 years from now. It's an investment. So we don't look at it from an absolute standpoint. We look at it very strategically. Yeah, it, it's amazing to me that as successful as Kia has been in the U.S. market, I think one out of three car buyers don't even know Kia is in the market. So there's a lot of upside yeah. potential. You yeah. just need more hamsters out there dancing, I guess. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Tila, what's your, your thoughts on, on that, of uh, what automakers uh, should be doing and trying to maybe get some of this revenue stream? Yeah. So I, I, I totally agree with what Henry was saying, because at the end of the day, this is all about enhancing the customer experience, right? Because if you can tie that customer into your own ecosystem as a car company, then you won. Because now all of a sudden you extended the value proposition be beyond your car product to create something else that's more tangible. But there are aspects of how you can actually monetize some of this stuff. There's a lot of data 
coming out of the vehicle. There's a lot of information about what you do while you're sitting in your vehicle. But does the, the owner of the car, the driver of the car, own that information, or can the car co companies tap into that? I think they can tap into this. We asked consumers actually that question. We did a study, a representative study in the United States, to see if they would be willing to share some of that information. In return, they get value back. Maybe information that's more targeted at them, personalization being one of those aspects. Maybe you save money on your insurance, and so on. So. About 40% already today of U.S. vehicle owners are okay with sharing some of that information. That means those 60% aren't. However, if you ask actually, would it be okay to collect some of that information about you and aggregate it and make it available to everyone because now we have better traffic flow, we can maybe lower the emissions, all of a sudden you have a much larger group of consumers that is interested to support this. So there are individual benefits and there are societal benefits in this. And I think that's pretty interesting. I do believe though that once we tap into this data, governments may also want to tap into this. And, and we all think about all of us getting a driver license when we're 16. That's a privilege, that's not a right. And I always point that out because going forward, there might be strings attached to that privilege that you might actually have to contribute data while you're driving because otherwise you're not allowed to be on the road because now you have to contribute to optimizing traffic flow. Mm -hmm. And with autonomous cars, that may not just apply to somebody who's 16 years old or older. <laughs> That's right, or, or even really young, right? It could be anyone going forward in an autonomous car. And I definitely believe you will see that becoming even more important once we get to these self-driving vehicles. Because at that point, you do have to share information because it's a machine running it and everybody can benefit from it. But that's a whole different chapter that has other benefits and, and unfortunately challenges to it too. Jim, let's go back to safety for a moment. We've got all this information coming into car. We've got everybody trying to grab a part of the revenue stream. We've got data going out and maybe benefiting from that. But doesn't there have to be a separation from data coming in and going out and the operation of the car? People are terrified of their cars getting hacked. Uh, yeah, absolutely. That's, uh, that's a huge issue, and it's something that the industry is working on. Uh, there is a lot of data, um, and, and I, I agree. I think the data can be used, uh, but we have to respect and understand the trust expectations of the customer and how much data we are releasing and then what it's, it's being used for. I think we've seen it in the past where companies have, a, have taken a certain assumptions, used that data, customers didn't know, and there was a backlash. Uh, we don't want to go there, and, um, and that's... that's uh, I think it's an important topic you bring up, and, and it's something that we're working on. Uh, you know, trust, security, uh, privacy are all huge issues when, whenever we're talking about connectivity, uh, even beyond uh, you know, infotainment, even safety. Uh, you know, with a connected vehicle, you know, it's another portal into the uh, into the vehicle, and it's another opportunity to uh, you know have that data used for the good or for the bad. I've heard uh, some companies say uh, there's got to be multiple levels of protection, mm -hmm. starting with encryption on the servers themselves sending information, and then two completely different systems, one that handles all this telematics yeah, yeah. and another completely separate system that just runs the car. Uh, what's Honda's thinking along those lines? I uh, tend to agree. They're, they're, uh, there's a lot of work being done conceptually right now uh, with regard to V2V and the security aspect of that. And who's going to run it? You know what what data is collected, and what and how it's used, and how do we uh, ensure a Kia vehicle is talking to a Honda vehicle, and how do we trust that information is critical. If we're if we're to take action on that information, we've got to trust it. And so, um, yeah, that separate organization that's able to uh, assure the the confidentiality and encryption of the of the data so it's not corrupt, is huge. Same thing at uh, Kia, keep those things separate? Absolutely. I mean, you would treat them as a class A, class B, class C. I mean, obviously, there's a priority. And in terms of how you architect the vehicle and the communication systems within the vehicle, it's fundamental and it's basic. And in terms of the communication, it really takes another level. Uh, and obviously, even within the space of V2V, which we talked about, there are actually spectrum that's allocated to, to the safety aspect. And there's a, there's a talk of actually having some of that spectrum being allocated to Wi-Fi. So there's a lot of discussions going on right now, which we, as OEMs, we're trying to explain uh, to the government that, hey, maybe this is not a good idea. You know, uh, Because there's a societal benefit yeah. to keeping that bandwidth, right, exactly. for safety, That's to right. keeping that bandwidth Wi-Fi in the Absolutely. It, And we should let everybody know this is not the Wi-Fi for your laptop. It's a totally no, different exactly. uh, signal. So it's really important uh, that whatever steps we take and how we architect things and how we uh, execute uh, very carefully because when you talk about safety, you have to consider all elements, all elements. Uh, so it's really important. Tilo, uh, <coughs> you talked about making this all personalized and for the customer and it's all about their experience. 
What's your advice to automakers as they look forward? Because in so many cases, I mean, if you look at automotive styling, design, mm -hmm. if you go out and do a clinic, you're going to come out with the blandest right, looking yeah, car. Right so how do car companies figure out what does the consumer want or need? Yeah. Well, a, if you ask consumers, they may not know five absolutely. years hence what they were, are going to want. Absolutely. Right? So there's always this story that you know, if Apple would have asked people if they want an iPhone, or you know, nobody would have said it. right? But I don't buy into that entirely because at the end of the day, a phone, for example, addresses a need, communication need, right? People have communication needs, mobility needs, and maybe information consumption needs in an automobile. So you have a basic understanding of what you have to enable in a car. How you do this, though, requires a lot of creativity also. You have to also have probably the courage to try something out new, and you have to watch what's happening outside of the automotive industry. And probably that's the most difficult aspect of them all, because most product planners in the automotive industry tend to look at the automobiles. We have been thinking about different model lines, different segments. That's not enough anymore. And I would even go so far to say that designers have to get much more involved in understanding how these technologies can even redefine interiors going forward. You want to touch things. One of the biggest advantages of an automobile over any other device platform is all the space that I have in a car. And I'm sitting in a seat, and, and I'm always sitting in the same seat if I'm driving. That's very valuable information if you want to create some new concepts of interacting with people that are completely new that we have never seen. And again, I go back to what I said earlier. All of this, I believe, will allow the automotive industry to be way ahead. In 10 years, 15 years from now, I honestly believe the automotive industry will provide that coolest mobile device because you can look at all of these new technologies and integrate them in a car. And think about, last, uh, last point on this, think about how many technologies come out of the automotive industry. So we have a track record of having automotive companies investing into new innovative technologies. Granted, they were more on the traditional mechanical and electromechanical engineering side. But if we apply that same mentality to maybe IT-related innovations, that's when we start to see some really cool stuff, and I have enough confidence that the industry will do it. Real good. Now we're going to do a little bit something different on the show that we haven't tried before. We're going to turn this over to Tilo for a few minutes because he's going to go through a lightning round of questions, and I get to answer finally and not just ask them all. <laughs> so, Tilo, I turn it over to you. All right. And the way we're going to do this, gentlemen, is I will ask you... A simple question, and please answer with yes or no. There's no, no skip or anything, yes or no. And we'll do this really fast. That's my little thing. I do this all the time when I do these kind of things. So I will start with you, actually, John, since you asked for it. You know, <laughs> you're going to be the, the first one who's out there. So by 2020, artificial intelligence will interact with us and anticipate our needs on a daily basis. Agree. Yes. Yes. Okay, very good. Jim, the next 15 years will bring more change to the automotive industry than the last 100 years did. Yes. It's an easy one, right? A little bit more tricky for you, Henry. Okay. Android will become the most dominating operating system for mobile devices, including cars. No. Did you see how long it took for me to answer <laughs> this one? There was a lot of thinking going on. All right. Next one for you, John. Software and data analytics uh, innovations will become more important than hardware innovations. Yes. Well, you're, you're good. Big data analysis, Jim, for automotive applications is overhyped. No. Big believer in it, okay. Question for you, Henry. Apple is one of our competitors. No. Okay, that's, that's eye-opening for me. Um, John, user interface technologies will become more important than content. Ooh, no. See, I would have said yes. I said it earlier. I gave you, I <laughs> Look, gave you the I'm answer. Look, I'm the content <laughs> creation business, brother. <laughs> yeah, okay, content okay. Is I, I understand, I understand. Makes sense, makes sense. <laughs> Jim, technology will redefine industry boundaries and eventually make them obsolete. Yes. Because that's a big one. Think about this, right? I, I talk about this as a concept of industry convergence, where maybe an automotive company will do something completely different going forward. Jim, by 2030, driverless cars will replace cab drivers and pick up groceries for us. By 2030. Or Henry. Jim or me? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Henry. Henry. <laughs> so it's a yes with a little bit of uh, clarifying here. So uh, we do think technologically the ability to do that is there. I do think there are social barriers or headwinds that need to be re resolved before that happens. Okay, usually I don't allow that for an explanation. Well, I have to. Said, <laughs> but Since you asked me the tough yeah, question. Okay, fair, fair enough. <laughs> I, I'm going to do this. John, here's one for you. Um, I worry about driver privacy in connected vehicles. Yes. Okay. And then I have one question for, for you, Jim. I own bitcoins. No. You don't? Okay, because that's the geek factor question. I'm going to ask you that too. Do you own bitcoins? I do not. 
Henry, I think I know the answer. You know no. answer. Probably not, right? Yeah. Okay, then I have a wait, last... Wait, 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 what about you? Do you own Bitcoin? I, I, I don't. Okay. <laughs> My company pays me in Bitcoin, so yeah, <laughs> let's see what that's worth. So um, last question I want to ask all of you guys, because I'm, I'm, you know, I think I know the answers, but maybe you see it differently. I'm excited about technology innovations I don't know yet. And I'll start with you first, Henry. I'm very excited about technologies. Even the ones that you don't know yet? Yes. So you're not worried about anything that's going to destroy your business? Um, look at it from a positive of half class four. Good, good. I yeah. like that. Jim? I, I would agree, I, but I do think there are areas that we're, we may go into that we're not really sure yeah. where we're going and if there's a happy ending at the end of that rainbow. And so I think there is need for caution in the industry uh, not to follow every technology. That's Okay. Like, and John? I, I am excited by what I don't know. I think sure. uh, we cannot project what this is going to do to the automotive business. I think it's going to be transformational. Yeah, I totally agree. That's it from my yeah. side. Perfect. Tilo, you just made my job easier. I'm going to have you on the show a whole lot more often. But I want to thank all three of you. Tilo Kozlowski from Gardner, Henry Bizet from Kia, Jim Keller from Honda R&D. Great discussion, guys. This has been really cool. And uh, yeah, the big data thing. I think we could do a whole show just on big data and automotive how you mine consumers for information and the information within the car that others might pay for it. I want to thank you all three again for having come on. I want to thank all of you for having tuned in.